Some of you guys might be wondering, you know, what kind of board we're using in here. We just want to do a quick rundown of the actual studio we're using. Um, so this one uh, is actually uh, in the Expression College, if you didn't hear me mention that earlier. And I'm going to let Ryan explain what kind of board uh, we're using today in, uh, in one of their main rooms. Uh, so this is the SSL 9000J desk. Um, we are coming into a lot of these channels. We are using a lot of external pre's, but we're also using a lot of the SSL um, channel strips, a couple of the EQs. We don't have any compression going in um, on the way in, but then channel routes through this. This hits Pro Tools, comes back down to these faders, makes it back out to our monitoring system up here which, as you may notice, we have quite a few. Yeah, I noticed that we uh, we actually, when we first came in here, there were there were some concerns about like the kind of monitoring setup that we we're gonna be using. Um, and I noticed uh, that we actually switched them out and we even, uh, you can see that we have a, a set of speakers right here that are close to the, the computer screens, they're Focals. Um, Kenny, why don't you kind of explain to us the, the benefits of these Focals and what's going on in here as far as our monitoring setup is um, yeah concerned. well in here we had uh, the NS 10s which are in most studios um, and we use those as well they also had some Dyn audios in here but we brought the focals in because mainly because that's what we're used to mixing on so we're used to that sound and we wanted to use that and use something that we're familiar with we actually turned them upside down so the tweeter was a little more ear level, um, and they're sounding great. It's sounding closer to what we think this album is going to sound like, and it's, what we want it to sound like. Familiar familiarity is a particular thing when you're going into different studios. We like we end up going into all these different spaces. A lot of the reason guys love NS tens is because they are everywhere. So if you can go into any, any room and they have an NS ten, you know what it's going to sound like. Uh, the speakers I have at home are a pair of Focals. The speaker Kenny has at home is a set of Focals. Yep. So for me to be able to get a pair of Focals in this room when we're tracking this record, it is the most familiar I could be with this room. Obviously, I don't know the space itself so well, and the room is going to change that. But these are near fields, and I'm realistically sitting maybe four and a half feet from them. So the room is a factor, but it's much less so a factor. And having speakers that I know very well um, is a pretty big deal for me. All right, guys, we're going to take you on a guided tour of what we kind of went over last week during Mix Wednesday. We went over uh, the documentation and the setup for this session that uh, we're about to see. Let's take a walk. Hey dudes, so we're inside of the live room of the, I believe it's called the SSL J series room. Um, this room sounds great, uh, killer drum sounds. We've actually set the drums up in a very specific place. Uh, the room has a lot of cool dynamic features that make it really great for tracking drums, like uh, it has dynamic ceiling panels that can be flipped around, and it has these cool wall diffusers that you can open up and close and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we picked this side of the room because uh, Ryan has a lot of experience with this, this room. He knows where it, set, where it sounds uh, a, the specific way that he wants it to sound for this record. And uh, yeah, we've thrown a bunch of really awesome microphones on this kit, but it's not like we just threw them on the kit to kind of capture a, a generic drum set. We actually, uh, it's very, very on purpose kind of techniques that were done to kind of uh, work with this band's music. So uh, Ryan can kind of take you through what he's done uh, with some of the stuff because you'll see that there's stuff like dual, you know, overheads and some other room microphones around here. So yeah, Ryan, you want to show us, uh, kind of give us the quick rundown of yep. the kick all the way up? Yep. So as you can see, there's a ton of stuff on this. Um, if you were in last week, you already saw the input list. If you weren't, uh, I'm sure we can bump up a little slide of it right now, right here. We'll put it right between <laughs> my hands. Pause. That's the input slide. List. See the input list? All right, cool. It floats. It floats. <laughs> so we'll start with this. This is the kick tunnel. The kick tunnel's main purpose is actually to keep the kick out of the room mics, um, as well as kind of focusing a little bit of low end direction towards this mono room per se. Inside the kick tunnel, there is an inside kick mic. It's a D6 all the way inside on the pillow. 
There's a 421 just inside the hole. It's pretty heavily EQ. It's a very great rock and roll sound. A couple inches outside of the hole is an M88 because it's got a nice, dirty, vintage sound. Um, none of these are intended to be used all together at the same time. Rather, they're used for different tonal options. And then there's this outside guy, which picks up the whole kit, but also gets a really good amount of low end. And because it's distance, it's really well reinforced around 80 hertz. Let's move over this way and take a look at the snare. The snare setup is reasonably unconventional. Um, <laughs> you'll see up on top, we've got a Heil PR31. We've got the AKG451. On the side of the snare, we've got the 414. And underneath, we've got a 421 for snare bottom. The intention here is to have different tonal options for the snare itself. The dynamic mic on the top is your average dynamic tone, except it's just really, really punchy and great. The condenser mic on the top captures a little bit more of the top end, a little bit more of the attack, so it's really great for you know transient design type work, which we will go over a little bit later. This side mic right here, this is picking up the shell tone. You can actually very clearly hear the tone of <clears throat> the ring of the drum, and it gives the drum a note, which works really well, especially since we're using multiple snares on this uh, session. On the bottom is the 421 there. Not not too crazy of a snare bottom mic. Um, pretty, pretty common. Hi-hat over here, we've got a 184, cardioid, lovely Neumann microphone. Um, the two toms, watch your head, are a pair of 414s, this guy, this guy, about two and a half inches up, one inch out, 45 degrees-ish, aiming just a couple inches in from the edge of the head. Same with the floor tom mic, it's about the same. Both of them are in figure eight, because in figure eight you get slightly greater proximity effect than you do in cardioid. As well, the symbols are kind of off to its side, which puts them in the null for the figure eight, which is pretty helpful for me. Uh, next, we'll come up to these overheads. We've got um, MA200s, Mojaves, and we've got a pair of Earthwork QTC40s. The idea here is, again, tonal change. The QTC40s are extraordinarily clean, um, very natural sound. It basically sounds like you are standing in front of this drum kit listening to it. The MA200s are a little bit more harmonically rich. There are two mics. And the MA200s are also running through a pair of Chandler uh, preamps, which are also harmonically quite rich. So the intention here is we can create movement and dynamic change throughout the length of the song by switching the tonality of the drum kit, by switching which overhead pair we're using at a, at a given time. So let's say we want to do a really clean, pristine verse. It's just kind of sparse and just very natural. We'll use the Earthworks. And then we go to the slightly more driven pre-chorus or chorus, we'll switch to the Mojave's. The drum set is the same, yet we've given ourselves new tonal options. Let's go to the rooms behind you. It's the same idea with this pair here. So we've got the Neumann 183, which is an Omni mic. And we've got the Royer 121. The Neumann is the clean Omni pair. So this room pair is intended to be similar to the Earthworks in that it's just a very natural, real sound. The Royer, on the other hand, they roll off top end quite a bit, just the tonality of the mic itself. It's also figure eight, so it picks up a lot more of the space behind it in particular. It's just got a very interesting tonality. It's also pointed kind of down so that we get a little bit less cymbal. Um, and that also is running through another Chandler unit the TG1 and it's compressing it a little bit just to give it a little bit of breathing. Back here is one more space pair. And there's more. Way in the back over here, we got a space pair of 184s, cardioid. Um, pointed off here at the back wall, basically. The intention is to just get an extraordinarily long reflection. Um, if you listen to this on its own, you can hear the flaming against the original kit because it's that far away. But if you compress it hard enough, it just turns into an extraordinarily long decay. It's almost like just extending the length of your snare by pushing this into the, the sonics of it. Dan, anything you'd like to add? Or let's, shall we go over the actual room itself? Yep. 
Uh, if you take a look up here, up at the ceiling, all of these panels up there can be flipped around. This is the reflective side on this side. When you rotate them and flip them over, it's absorbing. So if you come over here, hopefully you can see this. The panels up here, the green color, those are absorbing. So those are above the close mics. We don't particularly want a lot of early reflections into our close mics, but we do want to extend the length of the room sound by reflecting the rest of the room out. So the rest of the room is reflective, but everything right next to the kit, like those wall panels and this ceiling is absorbing. So inside of this music, um, there are a lot of different ideas of depth and like Ryan was saying, to perceive the music in a specific way, you can you know, throw different rooms and different sections and all that. Um, but in order to achieve that, you kind of got to find the spot in the room that sounds good. So you don't want to get, you know, maybe some slap delay in your, you know, close mics, for instance. You don't want to get some dead sound in the room that, you know, maybe isn't fitting for the style of music. So it's important to kind of figure out where in the room the drums actually sound good. Because, you know, these rooms are shaped in very, very, very strange ways. I mean, um, a quick pan around the room, you can kind of see that you've got various different walls with various different angles, nooks and crannies everywhere. So you've got your dead spots, you've got your live spots, and you've got spots where, you know, maybe some room, some bass is collecting, stuff like that. So um, Ryan, he went to college here a while back, and he knows for a fact that this area right over here kind of has that really cool room sound that we need, that early reflection sound that just adds a lot of depth to your music. So um, what we can do is uh, we can kind of take you through the room and kind of explain to you um, maybe some sounds and areas where, um, you know, these drums are placed and what they kind of sound like. So um, I believe it's over here, uh, a lot of people, mm -hmm. where you said a lot of people put the drum most, most people put the drum kit right under this panel. Right. Right here. And it's probably because of the symmetry of the way this is set up like this. But can you come over this way so I can make some noise and we can listen to what it sounds like and hopefully this microphone picks it up reasonably well. So I find this spot to be a little bit dead and I can hear an early reflection off of the wall on, over there. Somewhere in, maybe it's that corner, who knows what it is. Um, so if I stand here and clap, this is where I get an idea of what the room sounds like. So. got a like a decent sound it's pretty even there's frequency wise there's nothing that really stands out too much but it's also a really really short decay if we take a walk over to dan over here and go over the other side of this kit the tonality of the room changes yeah yeah just just basically go to where his seat is did your accent just change did i just do that <laughs> sorry <laughs> i've got my mouth so like over here it's a little bit more of a live sound, that sound you want. Uh, it's a kind of a low mid kind of, I guess, uh, thickness. heavy. Yeah, it's like a thickness, right? So when you clap, <laughs> it really is that kind of drum sound. I know clapping and all that stuff isn't very much of a good example, but it is, it kind of gives you a better idea of what's going on as opposed to what Ryan, where Ryan was just standing, you know, so. Um, it's a little hard to tell now because the clapping is reflecting off the symbols and whatnot. The symbols ringing, yeah. yeah. But what we're looking for is even, uh, just an even response and uh, where it feels comfortable. We, we can just tell from talking. Yeah. It's a great sounding room. Just walk around, talk to each other, hit a floor tom, which yeah. is something we talked about. Yeah, but the important thing to know is that this is the space of the room that works with this music, right? So, you know, maybe you're working on another style of music, maybe you're working um, in some other vein, you're going for another sound, maybe you're recording for someone else, you're passing this off to another drummer, uh, sorry, another engineer. You're pro maybe you wanna go for a more neutral sound, right? Maybe this isn't the spot for you, but for this specific record, this is the spot. And we, you know, went into this room thinking that way. So um, I think it's important to kind of understand that when you walk into a room, you got to figure out what the room sounds like because that's ultimately what your sound is going to be the room drums re require an ambient space in order to you know kind of work and be heard and be recorded and if that space does not sound good then <laughs> your drums are not going to sound good so figure out space 
figure out where to put the drum set and, you know, check it out, you know, make mistakes, go and experiment to uh, take us Tom and walk around the room and hit it a bunch of times. So, um, yeah. And the same principle applies to what we exactly. you had mentioned uh, last week. We were talking about how you tried uh, the yeah, Earthworks these, one time these GTCs, a while back. I used them one time, like I said last week, on a drum set that sounded horrible. And guess what? The drum set sounded horrible. And I told Ryan that. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, dude, they sound exactly. <laughs> it, was, it was actually kind of, it was a little funny <laughs> in the way you just described it. Yeah, it wasn't basically, those words. Basically, basically, he goes, oh, man, I, I hate those mics. They sound terrible. Yeah. And I, I was like, well, what, what, was, what was wrong with that? He goes, well, the drum, it's, the drum sounded horrible. And I was like, well, did the drum sound good? And he goes, no. And I was like, well, then the mics were accurate. <laughs> so, um, Lesson learned. Same goes with the room. I mean, regard, yeah. if you're in a if you're in a bad sounding room, uh, your music's not going to sound as good. Exactly. Your microphones aren't going to sound amazing, and your tracks aren't going to sound amazing, and nothing can replace uh, source audio. Let's nothing uh, is as valuable as that. So guys, you saw the microphones we had set up in there. Um, I figured we should go over what the sounds actually are. Um, this is all of our drum kit. It is quite a lot of inputs. Then again, if you saw the input list from last week, it is very clearly a little bit nutty. Um, the biggest thing about having this many microphones on the kit is to realize that we're never gonna be using all of them at any one given time. We're using different portions of them for different tonality for different sections of songs or different songs entirely. So let me pull up the kit here. Um, this is our overall kit sound in one format. Um, the kick in mic, the D6 that's inside. I'm going to solo it up so you can take a listen. The kick out mic, this is the 421. kick mic is the sub per se and then we've got the m88 that's being heavily distorted <laughs> so it sounds super wacky on its own but i swear to god in context this all makes sense let's go to the, the snare this is uh well i guess we gotta wait for a section where he's playing the snare He's about to do a fill. Right so this is the snare top, the dynamic mic, the high LPR 31. This is the C451. This is the snare side mic, the 414. This is the snare bottom mic, 421. Maybe I shouldn't play this one because the channel's got some issues. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's some channel issues here. <laughs> Unless someone's got... Oh, they don't. There's, there's just some channel issues. All right. So, the idea here is that we can change our kit sound just by changing what we've got going on here. So, this is one version of the drum kit we've got here. Pretty straightforward, nothing too crazy. Let's say we want to get a little bit messy with it. What if we do... Completely different drum sound. Yeah. Crush. Let's get a little bit even messier than that. from to start playing the drums again. <laughs> Another different drum sound. A lot of options. Let's go back to where we were before. This is our core drum sound. Let's move on to the overheads. So we had multiple pairs of overheads. One of them was very clean. One of them was a little bit dirtier. This is our Earthworks pair of overheads. You'll notice the symbols are extraordinarily clear, um, good stereo placement, very rich. 
Let's go to the Mojave pair. The Mojave pair is more of a whole kit pair. You'll notice these are quite different. Whoops. This snare in this pair is very strong and it's just a slightly more harmonically rich tone. Let's move on to the room mics. The mono room mic. This is the one that's just outside of the kick. Yeah, that, that will, that will. This is the... This is the 183 room pair. This is the Royer 121 pair. Slightly more distant sound, a little bit more saturated, a little bit of grittiness to it. Um, top end's rolled off. Pretty cool. This is the extraordinarily far pair. Reflecting up on the music stand. Yeah. a lot of opportunity combining the different rooms with the close mics. Right. Particularly the, you know, if you want a lot of character, the fire and the mono room it sounded awesome even just by itself. So right. if you have a part that you think it would go with, throw that up. Right. So let's let's do kind of a, a little little bit of a sample here of what we would use this for. Chorus two is that where the uh, bridge alt chorus? All right, cool. Let's do bridge through chorus. So we're gonna go back to our core drum sound. This is what I'd have during any bigger part of the song. Drums are rocking. Let's actually pull in a bit of the rest of the song so you can hear what's going on. Anyways, that's a pretty simple way that you can create different drum tonalities and movement just by having multiple sets of room mics, multiple sets of overheads. Um, they allow you to move the song forward um, using just your input channels rather than trying to recreate all these concepts in mixing. We've semi pre-mixed the song in that we started recording this song with the mix already in mind. Um, so we knew the places we were going to go with these concepts cool so kenny what did we do with the snare drum to get the sound this way so what we did was we sent the 451 the snare top condenser um through a transient designer spl transient designer and we made the attack uh as loud as possible and took the sustain all the way down you can see right there Snare top D, it looks like stupid. Um, well, what's the, what is the value of doing that? Basically what that's going to do is we're going to supplement the snare sound with that to give it a ton of attack, a really nice crack. We're going to show you just how nice it is and 
how effective it is. Um, so I will cut it out now. Unmute it. So this is without. That's what we're doing. Back that up. But we're gonna back it way up. So mute it. On. Solo that on its own. So people can hear what that sounds like. That's all it's doing. It sounds completely unusable. So what's the difference between doing that and using a gate? Right. Well, you can kind of get away with doing this with a gate. It becomes a multi-step process. Basically, you could gate it as tight as possible, extraordinarily tight, knock it down to maybe 30 milliseconds, 40 milliseconds, um, and then push some of the top end so that it's very attack heavy. You could do it that way. The transient designer is just a tool that makes it very easy to do it. It's two knobs, attack up, sustain down. It works that way. When I don't have a transient designer or a mix session has been sent to me that doesn't have something like this in it and I feel like it needs that en energy and that kind of snap, I will do it with a gate. Uh, I'll do it in plug-in form. I'll duplicate the snare out. I'll put a gate on it that's extraordinarily tight and then I'll bump some of the irritating up upper mids. And when I say irritating, I mean, they're not actually irritating. They're just very, very present. And it functionally does the same kind of thing as this. And if you want a moment in your song to sound really intense and really big, you can leave this muted out. And then when you get to that part, unmute it, all of a sudden your snare becomes the crackiest, most aggressive thing you could possibly imagine. Pretty awesome. So Very cool. Again, we'll show you without. In. Out. In. Cool. Very cool. Great.